Hello, I'm Byron. Uh, today I want to talk about The Moral Judgment of the Child by Jean Piaget. Uh, first things first, the first thing I want to talk about is the last part of the book. If you want to read this book, do not read the last part of the book, the fourth part. It's terrible, it's mostly about Durkheim's philosophy. It has really nothing to do with the rest of the book. So probably should skip that. But the first three parts are very good and they're very much like the rest of what Piaget has written. He, the, the bulk of Piaget is him just talking and relating almost verbatim conversations he has with children and talking to them about various topics and trying to learn how they feel about various topics. And it's striking. He's able to go in and just reveal how children think differently from adults. Very, very well and succinctly. And he never... I, I, I struggle to think of an instance where he... Where he elucidates an adult point of view. We're just meant to assume what an adult point of view is. Such as with his famous uh, water volume experiment. The water experiment was in the child's conception of number, not in this one, but I'm going to talk about that one for a little bit before I get back to the moral judgment of the child. The child's conception of number talked about uh, the volume of water, and he would ask the child, he would have a pitcher of water, and he would ask, and he'd have two different pitchers of water, that's it. One which was um, tall, and one which was wide but they'd have the same amount of water in it. And he would ask the child, which one has more water? And the child would almost always say the taller one. Sometimes they would say the wider one, but they would never say they had the same amount of water. And even when he would take the water from the larger pitcher, from the, not the larger picture, the wider picture, and put it into the narrow picture. Let's, for the sake of argument, it's not true at all, and it's important that you realize this is not the case. But let's, for the sake of argument, for, for the sake of simplicity, say that the child always thought the taller water picture had more water in it. Uh, even when he would take the picture of water from the, the wider, shorter jug and put it into the taller, narrower one and asked which one had more water. The child would say, there's more water now because it's taller. And it's pretty simple to see that the way an adult is meant to think of it is that it's the same because the volume of water stays the same and that's the way that it is but he never asked the child about the volume of the water he asked the child which pitcher has more water And at what point do we, do we re, the, the implication is at some point we realize that if the volume stays the same, there's always the same amount of water. And that's just the way it is. But is it? There, why should we equate the word more with volume? rather than with height. Well, I think it's to do with our experience with water. 
And this is a bit of a different conclusion than Piaget winds up drawing. And what part of the brilliance of Piaget is he draws very little conclusions, except in that final part, which was terrible. He just presents the experiments to you. And I think there is no correlation between saying there's more water, more and less water, and the volume of the water. It's only our experience and that what we use water for on a day-to-day -day basis is to drink and therefore the amount of drink that a water has is based on its volume. But there's no inherent thing that says that more volume means more. In fact, there are instances where you need certain, where height is actually more important. Say, in a bathtub. If you're in a bathtub, then the amount of water really has more to do with the height. Or if you're in a pool, the amount of water really, as long as it's at a certain depth, has more to do with the breadth of the water. So what's useful in those situations is the height. So the child is actually correct from that perspective when he says that when you take the water from the different container and put it in a taller container, there is actually now more water because more means taller. And why shouldn't it? And this is something I always think about when I read Piaget. And what the questioning I have is, does experience enlighten or does it corrupt? your thought. And that's an interesting thing to think about. And it is especially prescient. All of what I've said is especially prescient when we're thinking about morality as opposed, as opposed to say numbers because morality winds up being more contentious and more important in our day-to-day -day life. Um, anyway, that was an overview of just my thoughts on Piaget in general. As to this book specifically, what, th there is a bit of a confusion that he's very good at navigating between, of course, when he talks about morality of the child, one thing that comes up a lot is being naughty and being punished for being naughty. And he, he navigates very, he's doing this at around the same time as Watson's experiments. A little bit after. He's, he's very well aware of what Watson is doing, although he never really brings it up. One of them, which is, makes even more disappointing how often he talks about Durkheim instead of other psychologists. Um, but the, there are three things that get mixed together. One is morality itself, uh, the way to get to moral actions. Two is the morality of punishment itself. And three is the psychological efficacy of punishment. And he actually goes in and says, kids who are punished, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kids who are punished with randomly, capriciously, no, capriciously isn't the right word, but kids who are punished just because, w without the parents really thinking about it, the parents going, well, that's wrong, the child needs to be punished, or what that child did just upset me, it's time to punish the child. They wind up being more capricious parents, again, I don't think capricious is the right word, towards their children and punishing them in the same way because they themselves don't develop a well-founded morality 
and therefore just start punishing their children because the child has upset them. And don't really think about what they should be punishing the child for. And when he gets into children's interaction with each other, that's when he gets into sort of the moral... Uh, a child... I don't think any child has ever disputed in this book, in any of the examples, a parent's right to punish. But in many cases, they dispute the, the group or someone who was not a parent or not an authority figure's right to punish someone who has behaved naughtily or has hurt the group or who has hurt the group. Uh, which is very interesting. And one thing that it's just the nature of the time, but he, he actually does this more than most people at the time, but one thing he really doesn't do enough is focus on girls and the way girls behave. Uh, the very first part of the book is about games and how rules of games sort of lead to morality and reflect the way children think about morality. And he has, for the boys, he pretty much just talks about the game of marbles and how that is, and the rules of that game. And Marbles has fairly rigid rules to follow, and if you break the rules, there's punishments set out and stuff for breaking the rules. But with girls, he switches. I guess maybe because girls never played Marbles in Switzerland. But he switches to talk about Tag, which is a much different game. It has fewer rules and rules that can be easily just ignored and it's mostly about the, the the physical act of playing rather than the mental act of playing and so in both instances so by switching both at the same time he sort of uh cheats girls out of the analysis they deserve but by switching both from the way boys behave with games and the two different types of games, the largely mental to the largely physical game, it's difficult to parse which of these has caused the changes that he observes between the two instances. Anyway, Piaget's great. I love him when he's doing what he does rather than trying to become a philosopher, but I love him as a psychologist, as an experimental psychologist. Read this book, read every Piaget book you can get your hands on. Thank you. Bye.